Was it hubris? Was it naivete? Was it a plan so wild it just might work? Up until the moment everyone realized it hadn't, there were many factors that led to the tragic end suffered by the Donner Party, and they may have been doomed from the start. While the western part of North America had seen permanent European settlements dating back to the earliest days of the fur trade, the early 19th century was the start of the United States' large push to fully settle the western part of the continent. Starting with Thomas Jefferson's Louisiana Purchase and continuing through the century, the American frontier began pushing farther and farther west. By the 1840s, there were a lot of people looking to migrate west, and almost as many reasons for wanting to make the trip. Some of the settlers were in search of land, which was becoming more scarce in the eastern part of the country, while others later sought the get-rich-quick scenario that came with finding gold. Still others, namely a large number of Mormons that made their way west, were searching for a place to freely practice their religion. With so many motives for journeying west, there were also several ways to get there. According to National Geographic, several popular trails served as guides to settlers. Perhaps the most famous of all is the Oregon Trail, which started around the border of Missouri and Kansas before trudging across the Great Plains and snaking through the Rocky Mountains. There was also the Mormon Trail, which started in western Illinois and followed a similar path to the Oregon Trail. This one, however, ended up near what became Salt Lake City, Utah. They were tried and true routes, but even 19th century Americans weren't content to settle. The California Trail Center says that Lansford Hastings was one of the people who made his way west, doing so in 1842 along the Oregon Trail. His story was a little different than most. While many settlers had taken to the western trails to escape difficult lives, having been born the son of a doctor, Hastings had a comparatively comfortable life. After attending law school, Hastings made the trek to Oregon, but by 1843, he had made his way south to California. At the time, California was mostly Mexican territory, and Hastings recognized that there were immense opportunities there. In order to encourage settlers to carve a piece of land out for America, he published a book called The Immigrant's Guide to Oregon and California. In the book, he laid out a shortcut to California that he claimed would shave off nearly 400 miles over easy terrain. Was it too good to be true? Yes. Could we have looked into the future and seen the misery before us? These lines would never have been written. But we were full of hope. Legends of America says that Hastings never tested the route. Little did he know that his shortcut would inspire one of the American West's greatest tragedies. The idea for the group that would become infamously known as the Donner Party was started by an Illinois businessman named James Fraser Reed. Reed, like so many before him, wanted to travel west in search of riches, but he was also incentivized by the prospect of a better life for his wife, Margaret. She experienced severe headaches, and Reed thought that perhaps the West Coast climate would help her health. Reed read through a copy of Hastings' The Immigrant's Guide to Oregon and California and was inspired to put together a group for a westward journey. The initial group consisted of nine wagons and 32 people. Nine of those people were members of the Reed Party, which includes James, Margaret, their four children, Margaret's mother, and a pair of hired servants. While the trip was no doubt going to be arduous, James Reed paid to make sure that his family traveled comfortably. They did so in a two-story wagon that took eight oxen to pull and featured a stove, cushioned seats, and even bunks. It was so extravagant that Virginia Reed, who was 12 years old at the start of the trek, called it the Pioneer Palace Car. Over time, the group would expand as several other families joined what became known as the Donner Party. According to Legends of America, the group set out from Springfield, Illinois on April 16, 1846, and the first waypoint was the town of Independence, Missouri, the starting point for both the Oregon and California trails. Among the group were two brothers in their 60s, Jacob and George Donner, and their families. This trip wasn't the first for the Donners. They were of German descent and had started traveling before this event began. Starting in North Carolina and moving progressively farther west each time with stops in Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois. It's believed that the Donners were also intrigued by Hastings' proposed shortcut to the West Coast, as Jacob Donner kept a copy of his book in his saddlebag. What those in the Donner Party didn't realize was that a strange coincidence with some serious irony to it was taking place across the country. On the same day as they left Springfield, Lansford Hastings was departing California to see his proposed shortcut for himself. Reed and the Donner Party reached Independence, Missouri three weeks later. There, they resupplied and started again, eventually joining another wagon train about 100 miles west of Independence. This expanded the group to 87 people. Weeks later, the group would reach Fort Laramie, Wyoming. There, James Reed met a friend from Illinois who had traveled with Hastings eastward. This friend advised Reed not to take Hastings' shortcut, telling him that they would never make it using wagons, as the route was barely traversable on foot. He also warned Reed of the dangers posed by the desert and the Sierra Nevada mountains. More wagons joined the group in Fort Laramie, and upon reaching the Continental Divide at the Rocky Mountains, a man with a letter from Hastings met them. The letter said that Hastings himself would meet them in Fort Bridger, Wyoming, to show them where to take his shortcut, which was becoming known as Hastings' Cutoff. 
They had no way of knowing it at the time, but the decision that would cost many in the Donner Party their lives happened near Wyoming's Little Sandy River. To that point, the group had followed the established trail, but Little Sandy River marked the point where the trail split with Hastings' cutoff. A schism occurred in the group with some of the pioneers heeding the warning James Reed had received in Fort Laramie and opting to continue on the California Trail. Meanwhile, the other group, who were willing to risk it on the unproven alternative route, selected a new leader, George Donner. The Donner Party followed the Hastings' cutoff to Fort Bridger, but instead of meeting Lansford Hastings himself, they found only a letter that had been left with a group of other travelers. History says that this note said that Hastings had joined another group and had gone ahead, encouraging the Donner Party to catch up and saying that he would mark the trail for them. Feeling confident about Hastings' proposition, the group, consisting at this point of 89 people and 20 wagons, left Fort Bridger. If any member of the Donner Party was still hopeful that the rest of their journey to California along Hastings' cutoff would be smooth sailing, they would have been having second thoughts by the time the group reached Weber Canyon. According to history, Hastings had promised them that Weber Canyon would provide them with a safe way of traversing the Wasatch Mountains, a rugged part of the Rocky Mountains located in modern-day Utah. But upon reaching the canyon, the members of the Donner Party found yet another note from Hastings. This note warned them that this part of the route was more dangerous than he had initially believed. He advised them to wait there until he could return and show them a better way through the mountains. This put the Donner Party in a bind. To backtrack to Fort Bridger would cost them days. They decided to wait for Hastings, but when he still hadn't shown up after eight days, they sent a messenger into the canyon to find him. The party's messenger returned with instructions for an alternative route, which would take them through. The Donner Party traversed this pass successfully, but it turned out that it was more difficult than Weber Canyon would have been, as the members of the Donner Party were faced with thick trees and massive boulders. While returning to Fort Bridger would have cost the Donner Party a lot of time, it paled in comparison to what Hastings' alternative through the Wasatch Mountains route cost them. By the time they reached Utah's Great Salt Lake, the detour had cost them 18 days. Wasting so much time meant wasting valuable supplies. Making matters even worse, the party had several wagons get stuck in the mud and were forced to abandon them, losing them even more supplies. Next, the party traversed the Great Salt Lake Desert, which Hastings told them would take two days. Not only did it take more, but soft, wet sand caused more wagons to be abandoned. The stretch of the journey was 80 miles, and during the journey, they lost 32 oxen. The attitude of party members began to shift as they began getting frustrated with both Lansford Hastings and the man who had started many of them on the journey in the first place, James Fraser Reed. Lost time also meant that by the time the Donner Party reached the Sierra Nevada Mountains, it was late in the year, when the weather in the mountains is, and was, at its most treacherous. The Donner Party had finally made it to the Sierra Nevada Mountains, but because of the many delays they had faced, they got there as fierce weather started to appear. According to history, heavy snowfall on October 28, 1846 blocked the trail the party needed to take and trapped them in the mountains. Around this time, a broken axle on George Donner's wagon caused the group to split up, with most of the Donner family staying behind. Monday 30th, snow and fast wind, about four or five feet deep. No living thing without wings can get about. Multiple attempts to traverse the trail anyway failed, and the remaining party members were forced to build shelters to wait out the winter. Multiple families were forced to share hastily built cabins, crowding together for warmth. Food dwindled further, and they were forced to kill and eat the last remaining ox that November. After that, they ate whatever they could find, including bones and bark. By mid-December, a group of five men, nine women, and one child took a chance and left the camp to try to make it over the mountains. This group quickly ran out of food and was caught in a blizzard. As members of this group died, the survivors turned to cannibalism. In early February of 1847, several search parties, including one led by James Reed, left to look for survivors. Two weeks later, they found what they thought was a deserted camp, but quickly learned it wasn't. Not yet, at least. Many of those still there were close to death, and as rescue efforts dragged into March, the scenic locale would be dubbed Starved Camp. The party really did eat everything else first. Oxen, then their hides, leather, bones cooked and recooked. Michael Wallace, author of The Best Land Under Heaven, The Donner Party, and The Age of Manifest Destiny, explained to NPR, they ate literally everything before they had to turn to human flesh. They, of course, killed the great oxen, the horses, everything, and ate that meat. They boiled the hides. They picked out the bone marrow. They made this gelatinous, awful goo from the hides, and it had very little, if any, nutritional value. After everything else was gone, they were then left with each other. It's unclear who might have been deliberately murdered to provide meat for the survivors. It's certain that two Native Americans were shot and butchered. In a February 2017 interview in Smithsonian, Bill Schutz, author of Cannibalism, A Perfectly Natural History, explained why we shouldn't be so quick to judge. We have these sets of rules we try to follow, but when the going gets tough, that stuff eventually goes out the window. 
there's a biological directive to survive. And at that point, when you reach that extreme, you're not worried about the fact that there's a taboo. You simply want to live. The misery we endure would make the coldest heart ache. We are so weak, we can scarcely walk. Rescue parties spent more than two months trying to find and save those who survived. Of the 81 trapped by the snow, 45 walked out alive. Roughly half had engaged in cannibalism. Only two of the original dozen families made it out to California without suffering a death. The grisly tale of the Donner Party found its way into newspapers in 1847, where those who survived the ordeal were painted as murderers and derided for poor conduct, including alleged cannibalism. Survivors' accounts of what happened during the winter of 1846 and 1847 varied a great deal. Blame was placed on Lansford Hastings for a shortcut, which fell out of use almost immediately, while others blamed James Reed for ignoring the warnings he had received at Fort Laramie. The Donner Party incident and the publicity it received caused a significant reduction in the number of people traveling across the continent, but that dip wouldn't last long. In 1848, just a year later, gold was discovered in California. It was the beginning of the gold rush, and by 1849, thousands of people were once again racing out to California in search of riches. Ironically, many of these people traveled to the Sierra Nevada mountains and the surrounding areas, the same place where many members of the Donner Party met their deaths. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about history's most tragic episodes are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.